All right, Mark chapter 4. And uh, let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for your beauty and the beauty. We see your beauty, Lord, through our brothers and sisters here at church, through nature, Lord, through <laughs> little serenity, Lord God. So wonderful to see her coming in today. Uh, Father, we see your beauty in the way you've worked in so many people's lives, and we look around, and, and Father, we can remember when you worked in that person's life and did a miracle in that person's life, Lord, and, and worked in our church, Lord, and, and used our church in, in unexpected ways to bless people, Lord, and you've, you've come in, Lord, and, and saved us numerous times. Father, God, you are beautiful, and we love you, and Father, we want other people to know you. It's not like we want to force our ways on other people. We want people to know how good you are. We want the whole world to know how good you are. We want to see people lay down their, their guns and their hatred and, and, and just rejoice. We want to see hands lifted up, not in anger, but in praise to you, Lord. We want to see people uh, in love with you, learning to, to love and forgive and to have patience, to have mercy, Lord, uh, to have compassion, Father. Lord, we often miss the mark, and we don't, we don't want to, and we don't want to waste our lives, Lord. We don't want to take your blessings and not be grateful. We don't want to live in our salvation, Lord, and not be eager and hungry to share that with other people, Father. So, Father, here we are. Uh, we're a church that wants to serve you. We started that way. We want to we end that way, Lord, and we want to use our, our church, Father, to reach people in our community. And as, as uh, was it Brother John or Stephen prayed, Lord, not just this community, Lord, but help us to reach out from here, Lord, and, and to bless people uh, in our region and, in fact, all around the world, Lord. Help us to carry the message of your cross that you love, that you paid the sacrifice for our sins, that there's a way to have peace with you and to for, have forgiveness and eternal life if we would just turn from our wicked ways, repent, and come to you, Lord, in faith, Father. And that's the message we want to take everywhere we go. Help us, Father, not to just take it overseas, not just to take it to people we don't know, Lord, but to bring it to our families, that our children would raise up and praise you, that our children would raise up and be very brave and heroic for the cross, Lord, that our children's lives uh, would also be spent in service to you, Father. Lord, you are beautiful, and we thank you that we get to follow such a wonderful God. Please, Lord, challenge our minds, sharpen our minds, and open our hearts as we study your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Today's uh, message is, why should I listen to Jesus? Why should I listen? To, that's a good question, right? Uh, as Christians, we believe we should listen to Jesus. We believe it, but have you asked yourself why I should listen to Jesus? Or, or maybe thought of it from the perspective of somebody who doesn't believe Jesus yet. Yeah, well, why? I I don't, Confucius may have been a good teacher, but I don't do all the things he said to do. Uh, you know, Siddhartha Gautama maybe was a, a good teacher. I don't do all the things. He, my math teacher is pretty good, and I'm not doing everything that he told me to do. Uh, why should we listen to Jesus? And, and maybe your thoughts were right away, well, because he loves us. And that's a great reason to obey him, right? Yeah, like kids want to obey their parents. And maybe you thought, because he died for us. Who else has done anything more for us? Last week, we, we ended the sermon by saying uh, it's not crazy to, to want to uh, obey the things of God. The crazy thing would be to prioritize anything in our lives over the things of God. Jesus died for us. What, we sh what would be a greater priority in our lives than to, to follow and obey him? Many of us probably, if you're honest, right, you're going to look at your own life and why shouldn't why why should I follow Jesus? And you're looking at your life, say, well, why not? I can't do any worse following Jesus than going my own direction. So why not follow Jesus? I I know that whenever I do things my way, it's a, a dead end. I know I like bring a lot of suffering on myself. I bring suffering on the people around me. I can be awful silly, foolish. I can be awful hard, difficult. Why not follow Jesus? His ways got to be better than this, right? Today in Mark 4, we're going to see that very question addressed. But it's going to be addressed, why should we believe in Jesus, with another question. And that question is, who is this guy? 
who is this guy? Because the answer to that tells us why we should follow Jesus. All right. Hopefully uh, everybody's turned their Bibles to, to Mark 4. I think there's something beautiful about holding your own Bible to, to open up to the chapter to, be, to get used to go, uh, find your way around the scriptures. Uh, you know, I think it's wonderful that we have phone apps and whatnot to have your Bible on. That's awesome. But when you see somebody walk into a restaurant or something, they're carrying this, you know what that means. When they're carrying their iPod or Kindle or whatever, you don't know what that means. This is a beautiful thing to have on your desk, to carry around with you, and to, ha and to familiarize yourself with. And guess what? The batteries never die. So, so Mark chapter 4, and we're going to see Jesus do an astounding miracle that causes even his disciples to rethink what they knew or what they thought they knew about him. But before we, but we go there, uh, we're going to see some. We're going to see Jesus teach some um, uh, several par uh, parables, some important things. I want you to just reflect on what I just said. Imagine you're in that first century church. Remember, we did this with with the Book of Matthew. You're in the first century church. There, there are no scriptures yet. You have some letters from Paul. We know those are scriptures, but there's no, there's no gospels yet. And you get the, the book of Mark, and you're going through this, and you realize Mark's moving fast. He's trying to teach me who Jesus is. He wants me to know who Jesus is. And we get to this chapter, and Jesus starts teaching. Now, who's Jesus? Real quick. Son of God, right? God incarnate, God in flesh. God, creator of this huge, gigantic universe. God coming down to our little mud ball, speck of dust planet. He says, I want to teach you guys some things about the way heaven does it. Not the earthly mentality, not the human mentality, the way heaven does it. So as we're reading here, through here, don't just think, yeah, I read this before. I heard this when I was a kid. This is God coming to earth, and what does he have to say? What is he going to tell us? The point, uh, and by the way, a parable is, is not two cows, male cows. A parable, yeah, yeah. A parable is uh, just kind of a fancy word for an extended analogy or a short uh, story. Jesus is making a comparison. And he's making a comparison between the things of heaven and the mundane earthly things. God's way, and then he, he wants to get something that people can understand from their own reality, their own lives. And a parable is just God comparing uh, spiritual truth with earthly truth so that something in the, the people's minds can click and say, oh, now I get it. Oh, yeah. The point of using these parables, these, these analogies, is to make people think, to help people arrive at truth. Jesus said, I came for truth. I came uh, to, so that people would know truth. Sometimes I think it's overemphasized. Uh, parables are a very important part of Jesus Christ's ministry. I think sometimes it's overemphasized that he only taught in parables. No, sometimes he said, uh, get thee behind me, Satan. Sometimes he calls people a brood of vipers. I mean, uh, Jesus could be jaw-droppingly direct. Jesus could be painfully direct. But parables, telling the stories to unlock people's thought process, was a huge part of, of his ministry. And so I want us to look together, read together from Mark, and we're going to look at uh, 1 through 9. And again, remember, uh, the early church father said that Mark is not putting things in chronologically, perhaps. He's grouping ideas together, stories that Peter would say he's writing all this information together so that it flowed. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching, he said, listen, that's the first thing. If there's a God who created a trillion galaxies, and he comes down and takes on flesh, and he says, now pay attention, that's a good clue that we should do what? Pay attention. Yeah, let's, let's be aware. Let's be alert. Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And a lot of people think, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, got that. I understand that. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. 
But when the sun came, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among them, uh, among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, sometimes multiplying 30, sometimes 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 9, in verse 9, Christ is giving us, Christ it right there is giving us his purpose for speaking in parables. It's not to hide or disguise the truth, but to reveal it to who? Those who are willing to listen, and that's the key. Brothers and sisters, this is a good time for a question. In my heart, in your heart, are we willing to listen? When we hear the word of God, taught is our reaction to defend ourselves to make excuses to push god away to say not now maybe later are we willing to listen are you willing to hear what god is telling us jesus said whoever has ears and a heart to hear then let him hear all right let's continue 10 through 12. jesus says whoever has ears to hear let him hear when he was alone, the twelve and some others, so there was other people besides the core, the twelve there, around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those outside, those who don't have ears to hear, everything is said <clears throat> in parables so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and they would be forgiven. Sometimes people read this and, I, and uh, they say, wow, Jesus spoke in parables because he didn't want people to understand them. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever thought that maybe? Wow, Jesus was speaking in parables so that people would not understand them because they may be ever seen but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven and boy, we wouldn't want that, would we? Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, no, no, you're right. Does not make any sense. He doesn't, he doesn't want people. He's going to come to earth and die for people, and he doesn't want people to believe. First, I want to ask you, what the heck are you thinking? Does that sound like Jesus? Does that look like Scripture? Where else in the entire Bible are you reading along and you start thinking, yeah, God sure don't want people to be saved. Woo! If this is out of step with the entire Scriptures, Maybe that knee-jerk reaction says, oh, I, I understand this verse. Jesus taught in parables because he don't want people to understand. Maybe that's an unreasonable way to interpret it. Maybe uh, we ought to read it in context. Firstly, in context of the entire scriptures. Uh, for example, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Oh, well, okay. Well, that just proves there's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, let's go. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving to God be made for all people, for kings and for those who are in authority, that we may live peaceful lives and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, our God and Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, what about the Old Testament? The Old Testament... God didn't want people to be saved. Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, this is God speaking to his prophets, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they might turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O people of Israel? And I didn't say turn twice. God said turn twice. God is passionate that people would turn and repent. So maybe we ought to look at that verse a little differently. So the, the context of, of Scripture in general there is clear. God wants us to believe in him, trust in him, and love him. So if you don't get that, you haven't been paying attention. Or, or there's a stubbornness, you don't want to get it. In, in the immediate, how about the immediate context of Mark 4? We just read in verse 9 that Jesus is saying these things 
To those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He wants them to hear if they're willing. And now if we skip down to verses 21, 22, and 23. Look down, chapter 4, 21, 22, 23. He was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? It is brought to be put on the lampstand. For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus wants the truth to be revealed. So the general context of Scripture is clear. God wants us to hear from him and be saved. And the immediate context is very clear, both before and after this verse, that God wants us to have ears to hear. So what is Jesus saying here? To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables, so while seeing they may, in, so while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. Well, it might help to know that Jesus is actually quoting from an Old Testament prophet named Isaiah, a great prophet in the Old Testament, Isaiah 6. And I'm going to read the whole context here. Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 11. And this is the calling of a young Isaiah. The young prophet is being called by God to become a prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. They were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken for with tongs from the altar with it. He touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. First off, if God in heaven is looking down at the city of Janesville, and I just read in the, I read in the newspaper this week that only 51% of people in Janesville uh, say they're affiliated with the church. And affiliated means, what do you call those? Christians, Christmas and Easter, Christians. Affiliate, only 51% are even going some of the time. Uh, you've heard me say before that if we took every church in Janesville and filled up every single chair for every service they alter, the vast majority of people in Janesville couldn't even have a place to sit down. When we want to grow the churches in Janesville, when each church wants to grow, they're not competing with one another. We are fighting to win the souls of the lost. We're not fighting other churches. We want their church, and we want every Bible-believing church to be packed out every single Sunday. That's our heart. That's our prayer. So when God from heaven is looking down at the city of Janesville, and he says, Who's gonna, who can I send? Who will go? We don't want to be the ones who say, oh, too busy. When God looks down at Foundation Bible Church, I hope he hears us say, God, we're here. Please use us. We're here, Lord. We want to be used in your hand. We want, we want to help people get to heaven. We want to, we want to see the power of God changing lives. We want to see hopeless people find hope. We want to find lonely people find community. Lord God, here we are. Please love our community through us. And the prophet Isaiah, he despaired. I'm not worthy. I'm a sinful man. I'm a part of a sinful community. God says, you are forgiven. And then God says, who am I going to send? He says, here am I, Lord. Send me. Aren't those words beautiful? I want you to think in your heart, brothers and sisters, have you said that to the Lord? In your workplace, in your school, how is Jesus going to reach your school? How is Jesus going to reach your neighborhood? God, I'm here. Could you use somebody like me? Lord, please use me. Lord, I want that more than anything. Help me to love people into heaven. Help me to bring the message of the cross to people all around me. Here I am, send me. Is that the prayer of your heart? 
Let it be the prayer of all of our hearts. If we love Jesus and he loved the world enough to die for them, let's live for him and let's live to share this message with everyone around us. I don't want to waste my heart for anything, my heart and my life for anything lesser. That's a good time to say amen. And God said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. See, this is not God doing it to them. This is the prophet saying, you guys are hearing all the time. You guys are hearing religious stuff all the time. You guys are hearing about it, but you don't understand. You never understand. You're always looking, but you're never perceiving. Make the heart of the people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Say it so much that they get tired of it, never stop saying it, just keep saying it, saying it. Otherwise, otherwise, if they did hear, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. See, what, see how that verse goes? The point of him talking is so some people would turn and be healed. <coughs> God is saying anybody who turns. So it's not God saying you can't turn. God is saying the ones who do turn will be healed. And then the prophet said something interesting. Well, how long do I have to do that? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without, he goes on, and basically, till ruination comes right to the end. Right to the end. Do you want to do the Christian thing? How long do you got to do it? I got to use my life that way. God, here I am. My time, my talents, my tithe. Use me, Lord. How long do I have to keep this up? Until the cities lie in ruin. <laughs> Until the end. The Net Study Bible points out that the parables Christ taught were either revealing or concealing, depending on the attitude with which you received them. Isn't that interesting? Jesus taught in such a way that they were either revealing or concealing depending upon your attitude. Jesus knew Isaiah's calling. God basically told the people through Isaiah, tell the people, listen continually, but don't understand. Look continually, but don't perceive, because if you did, you could turn and be saved. Go ahead, be stubborn, and miss out on the good that's right before you. In other words... People that Christ was speaking to in parables were outside the kingdom. It was his intent that those who were willing would listen, would hear the message and be saved. The good was right in front of them if they would only see it, only accept it. Okay, Mark chapter 4, verse 13, 13 through 20. Jesus is going to explain this parable that he just had. Everybody awake? All right. Uh, don't you understand this parable? That's kind of sad, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind of disappointing. There's Jesus right next to you, and, and they don't get it. And he says, you guys don't get it? it? Sometimes we, dost thou not understand this parable? We, sometimes they have flowery language. But he's basically looking at these guys and saying, what? What? Was that too difficult for you guys? How then are you going to understand anything? <laughs> the farmer sows the word. Okay. You know, let's take this step by step. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. And I believe this, and I've seen it happen many times, brothers and sisters. Pray. When we're sharing the gospel here, when the message is going out, after church, pray. Because so many times I've seen people come to church for the first time, and they've got tears in their eyes, and they say, this is what I, we've had people come and say, this is what I needed, this is what I've been looking for. Before next Sunday comes around, before we can talk to him again, Satan plucks that seed out. Yeah, 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 maybe I overreacted. Maybe I really don't want this in my life. Do we have an enemy? The enemy does not want you in church, and your enemy does not want you sharing your faith. And the enemy, as soon as somebody hears the gospel, he's going to try to divert their attention, get them worried about something else, get them concerned about something else before they'll open up their hearts. It's not just us in a world that doesn't like our message. There's the, there's the fire of hell burning against everything we do and say for Jesus Christ. We have an enemy, and he is mighty. Thankfully, we have a Savior who's much, much mightier. 
As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. This is what Jesus is saying. Others, like the seed sown on a rocky place, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble comes, when persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And seeing all the horrible persecution that's going on uh, of Christians in North Korea, in the Middle East, horrible, horrible persecution. And uh, we're sometimes worried to live out our faith because that, that, you know, that jerk at work that doesn't like me anyways, I'm worried what he'll think about me. So I'm not going to live out my Christian faith because Jesus died for me and he's the master of the universe. And Well, I can't finish that thought because it doesn't make any sense. But, but I am worried about what other people think of me. And so we were studying in, in Hebrews. The girls and I were read through a chapter in Hebrews last night where it talks about the early Christians rejoicing when their families were broken up and when their pop property was confiscated and they lost everything for the sake of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't wish that on you. I don't wish that on me. I wish that kind of faith on all of us that we could say the things of God are worth more than the things of earth. Verse 18, still others like seeds sown among the thorns hear the word, but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things came in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like a seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, a hundred times what was sown. In other words, the message in their life, they reproduce this message uh, many times out to, to everyone around them. Friends, I asked you earlier, are you willing to listen? Are you willing to hear? The question now is, assess yourself, what kind of soil are you? What kind of soil are you? Where did you find yourself, if you found yourself? Where, where did you find yourself in that parable? What kind of soil are you? And more importantly, more importantly, what kind of soil do you want to be? When you're reading through there, do you say, Lord, did you find yourself there in, uh, or did you find yourself where you'd like to be? And as, as you read the passage, did you, did you think yourself, did you catch yourself saying, whew, safe. I believe in Jesus, so I'm safe. Or was there an ache, a burn in your heart on the inside? Lord, I want to be good soil. I want to be the good soil. Lord, I want you to do something in my life. Lord, I... I want to produce a harvest of righteousness in my life for you. God, please use me. I want to see people saved. I want to see people become Christians because of the way I live my life. Lord, let my life matter, God. Please let my life count. I want to produce a crop in my life 30 times or, or 60 times or 100 times <coughs> what was sown into me. So, brothers and sisters, first question, do you have ears to hear? Second question, what kind of soil are you? What kind of soil do you want to be? <coughs> All right. Water time. <coughs> okay, continue on from verse 21. <coughs> 21 <coughs> through 25. He said to them, do not... Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl <coughs> or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? Well, what does a lamp do? It reveals things. It lights things. A lamp shows where there's darkness. If you have dirty hands, you can't see it in a dark room. You see it in a light room. Uh, a lamp can help you see the correct path to go so you don't bump into stuff and stub your toes. A lamp reveals. It shows the way like a lighthouse. And do you take a, get a lamp <coughs> and then you're going to put it under your bed or get a lamp and put it under a cover, what would be the point of the lamp? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more, those who have will be given more. As for you, as for those who do not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. 
We are responsible to act and respond to what we know. We're not responsible for what we don't know, what we haven't been given. When we hear the good news, brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility to respond. Jesus Christ is Lord, I better bend the knee. Jesus Christ is offering forgiveness, I better accept that forgiveness. Heaven's gates are open wide, I better take a step through that gate. After we've accepted the light, we're responsible to act upon the truth that we now have. The more we understand, the more responsibility we are given to act upon that knowledge. And as God reveals to us more and more and more, it's our duty to live out our Christian lives, to shine this light, uh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Remember that song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Won't let Satan poof it out, I'm going to let it shine. Let your life shine so that other people can go to heaven. Let your life shine so that people can see the truth of God in your life. Don't hide it. It's not meant to be hidden. It's meant to be revealed. Now next we're going to look at a parable that's only found in Mark, which is kind of neat because uh, we talked that if Mark was taken out as a shorter version, well, this was definitely added in because it's not found in Matthew. This next parable is only, this next passage is only found in Mark. We look at 26 through 29. 26 through 29. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, <laughs> the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk and then the head, and then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Uh, again, we're responsible to act upon the knowledge we have. We do our part. And in ways that we can't comprehend, God brings the harvest. And when you start something, you don't know how it's going to end. In the kingdom of God, he's not talking only about churches here, but think in the context of evangelism and church and living out our own lives. We start something for God. We do our part. We plant and then in ways we don't understand, God brings a harvest. And then when the harvest comes, our job is to grab that sickle and start harvesting. This is totally different from what ISIS is doing with their swords. We're harvesting people for Jesus Christ, harvesting uh, souls for the kingdom of God, bringing people into the family. Uh, we do our part, and which is what I want us to do with this Friday night service. We do our part. We let the growth, that's up to God. But when the growth comes, then we're ready to harvest it and help those people grow in Jesus Christ to make disciples of all people. Understand? That's our job. Okay, next, 30 through uh, 32. <clears throat> nope, just read that. Nope, didn't. Okay, well, let's read 30 through 32. And again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? <laughs> or what parable shall we use to describe it? is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes like the largest of all garden plants with such a big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Uh, <coughs> this is another one. We were talking about this, I think, on <coughs> Thursday evening. One of those little things that people, this whole book that's revealing our hearts to us like nothing else, that's, that's speaking a beautiful truth that's beyond anything human beings have ever written, and people look at, ah! Mustard seed is not the smallest seed on the planet. And, and the, the, uh, the mustard plant is not the largest of garden plants. Therefore, Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. Therefore, I can ignore all the rest. It was so convicting anyways. That, how silly. For one, when you read the word, when I say earth, I know what you thought. You thought globe. Newsflash, they didn't know the world was a globe. When he was earth, said earth, he's saying everything around the ground from horizon to horizon, this is the smallest seed that we know in this area. The other thing is he was speaking poetically. Uh, Jesus knew that in the Garden of Gethsemane that there were uh, olive plants there, olive trees. Jewish people planted olive trees in their gardens all the time, and an olive tree is about double the size of a mustard tree. Everybody knew I think when they heard that, nobody was saying, aha, he doesn't know what he's talking about because I have an olive tree and it's bigger than a mustard seed tree. Everybody knew that 
this little tiny seed, this is the smallest one around, right? And it grows to this big, giant tree, the biggest one in the garden. And then the birth, everybody is understanding, wow, the kingdom of God has small beginnings. But it grows in this big tree. It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Jesus is saying, what I'm starting here with this handful of people is going to grow and grow and grow to the point where people can come and find safety, can find rest in the shade of this truth. The church of Jesus Christ with those humble beginnings has grown to cover the entire planet. Every country in the world has a church, has churches today, and everywhere people can find rest for their souls in the kingdom of God. Jesus said it's going to start small and it's going to grow big, and everybody can come in and find rest in the shade of this truth. Jesus predicted this when he had a handful of people and one was going to betray him. And today, it's true. Yeah, but it's not the smallest seed in the whole planet. In Papua New Guinea, there's smaller seeds. Yeah, you're, you're really trying to miss the point, aren't you? You're trying. Jesus was not speaking in scientific terms. He's speaking about the, the kingdom of God starting small and growing large. That's the point. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took with him, uh, uh, they took him along just as he was in the boat. I don't even understand that sentence. I was wondering about that. Leaving the crown behind, they took Jesus, just as he was, in the boat. Uh, there were also many other boats with him, which is neat, because I, I never remember reading that before. There was other boats with them out on the lake. There were, people were going to follow him or something. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, Maybe they took him just as he was. Maybe he's already asleep. <laughs> the disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we all drown? He got up. Ugh. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, oh, Why are you guys so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? And that's a clue why I too should believe. Uh, his, the, Jesus is wholly othered, something alien, something bizarre happened. They are petrified. They are filled with awe. We started today's message by asking, why should we listen to Jesus? All his teaching, all these parables on the kingdom of God, and the answer is found in the question the apostles were asking, who is this that even the waves and the wind obey him? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? That's our answer for why we should listen to Jesus as well. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.